Good morning, saints of our Lord, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for tuning us in this morning on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Today is Tuesday, September the 21st, and we gather this next hour around the gift of the inspired and true Word of God and put on our Christ goggles and on, in Leviticus chapter 7, excuse me, we have been knee-deep with offerings, and chapter 7 seems to kind of be a, be a, a final wrap-up of sorts, last words to make sure that everything has been addressed, that people are clear on how this whole thing works, and to be honest, when we're done with today, I don't know if it will be more clear, but we do know that we'll be able to be in God's Word and to see Christ, for the gifts are ready, ready for you. A special thanks to our friends at Lutheran Heritage Foundation for their support of Thy Strong Word. Visit lhfmissions.org for more information, lhfmissions.org. To help us be strengthened by God's Word, we have the honor of welcoming back Dr. Timothy Seleska, Professor of Exegetical Theology at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri. Dr. Seleska, welcome back to Thy Strong Word. Thanks, Brady. It's good to hear you again. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Last time we started with Psalm 1 was the last time that we were together. So, uh, Dr. Seleska, what's going on for you, your family, and the, the work at Concordia Seminary? So we're doing all right. Started a new school year and very excited. Students are all great. Everybody's happy to have uh, our stuff in session. And we got intramurals going on uh, first time in (laughs) two years or something like that. Good participation. And our symposium is going on this week on beauty. And uh, Dr. Schmidt just gave an amazing opening presentation. And we got some other great speakers and things planned. So uh, it's going to be an exciting next few days for us. Well, give give us a quick uh, 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 a rundown or overview. What is a symposia at Concordia Seminary? What is that? Okay, yeah, no, good. So we take a couple days out of the fall semester uh, to gather around a topic and to think both theologically and um, kind of practically about important issues facing the church mm-hmm. and the world. And... Um, we bring in some outside speakers. We have uh, our own faculty uh, do some stuff, and we have both plenary presentations and um, smaller sectionals so that uh, pastors and uh, other uh, lay people even can uh, contribute to the symposium. And so it's, we really uh, want our students to come, and also uh, it's a good time for pastors, a number of Former graduates come and kind of have little reunions while they're here Mm -hmm. and get to talk a lot of uh, interesting theology that actually uh, is aimed towards uh, the church and practice in ministry. So um, this year's is this whole subject on um, contemplating beauty and how we as Christians think about beauty and um, what that means for our lives. And so... uh, a lot of a lot of interesting topics that are going to be presented on things like art and music and uh, uh, just things in the world uh, and how we think theologically about God's creation. Really, this is I appreciate the the um, uh, the thoughts on that because the reality is I I probably should have thought about that more when I was at the seminary. Oh, that's the point of this. I, I always thought, well, maybe it's the time for me to sleep in a little bit more. But anyways, um, it's <laughs> yeah, a yeah. it's a, a good a good for you, our listeners, to hear something like this because for your pastors and for your church workers, uh, deaconesses and DCEs and everybody else, we can get so deep in the weeds of thinking the practicalities that I know for me when I'm able to sit back and think about a theological subject, pray through it, to dig deep into it, to uh, have mutual encouragement of other church workers, it really helps me move forward and and think about ministry. So I encourage our listeners, first of all, to pray for your pastors and others to go to things like this so they can let that theology sink in a little bit. At the same time, encourage them. Hey, pastor. Hey, DCE. Hey, teacher. What have you been doing to sharpen your skills? Not for the sake of practicality per se, like right up front, but for the sake of reflecting on God's word and how that works in the world. What a great topic. Beauty. Something we obviously don't sit and think about, especially scripturally. So just a a good reminder for your prayers and encouragement. Yeah, thank you very much. And also, I mean, one of the things that probably has come out of the COVID thing is that um, we now can stream stream the sessions 
and record oh, yeah. them as well. So even lay people, you know, people who are interested in these kinds of topics, if you register, you don't necessarily have to travel here. So we still have limited seating, but and actually it's filled up, uh, you know, because of everything. Um, but there's an opportunity for the church at large to um, participate in our symposium uh, through live streaming and through the recordings. And uh, I think that yeah. that's a really cool thing that we can offer people because not everyone can travel here in the middle of a week, uh, right. halfway through September, you know. And uh, a... so people should <laughs> avail themselves as they are able, and pastors can publicize that too. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, Pastor, as, as we and we have our own theological reflection happening today on something not many people have probably theologically reflected on before, in Leviticus 7. But, Dr. Seleska, can you begin our time and ask for the Lord's blessings as we study God's Word in prayer? Of course. Uh, please pray with me. Uh, dear Lord, first of all, I'm thankful for everyone who has gathered around this bit of God's Word today. Uh, I thank you for our listeners uh, for the work of your Holy Spirit as he comes to us through his word. I ask that you bless our time together. Keep us mindful as we look at this book of Leviticus uh, of the great uh, act of grace that you showed us in your son, um, who is the uh, once and for all sacrifice for our sins and uh, through whom we are actually reconciled to the Father and uh have the uh, promise that we will live uh, forever with him. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Reminder to everyone, if you have any questions for us today concerning Leviticus, it can be prior to Leviticus 7 or uh, or our, our text today or in general. Just drop us an email, kfuo at kfuo.org, or call 314-821-0850. 314-821-0850. And it's a good reminder because we I, there's still a question for our listeners that, that asked about Leviticus 3 that I'm going to address in a future episode or study. And, and it is not just about Leviticus 7. It's about all Leviticus. And be patient because sometimes I have to do the homework and it takes a little bit longer than I, than I always want. But yeah, keep those coming and we can throw those at Dr. Seleska too. Dr. Seleska, we come to chapter 7. And chapter seven is kind of, I, I guess, the best one I will do in my study is kind of like an instruction manual for the offerings to make sure everything is is put together. You know, wow, that's kind of, and that's very simplistic. But as you look at chapter seven or prior, do you have any um, um, thematic or background how you want to start us off this morning? Well, I think if you did, you guys start at Leviticus one and have been working your way through. We did. Yeah, we're plowing through. Okay. So I think what you said at the beginning uh, is a kind of a good summary because the first seven chapters, as you know, uh, give the instructions concerning offerings, and then the topic kind of changes a little as you move to chapter eight. So there is a, a kind of a pattern to the book, so it's put together in a certain way. Um, and what you're seeing too is kind of interesting. So I, I don't know, always puzzled me that that he has given instructions previously for uh, what's called the guilt offering in verse 1, and then he talks more extensively about the peace offerings in verse 11. And so it's kind of a recursal, re is that the right word, of these kinds sure. of things. So he's kind of going back it. and touch, you know, <laughs> repeating some things and adding some things. And uh, it again, it's um, not like Western minds, like things, you know, why not just put all the instructions in kind of bullet points once and for all in one place where we can find them on the computer, uh, right. hopefully with a clear tab. Uh, but that's not how Moses kind of operates in Leviticus or even in the other books of the Bible. So there's a kind of a different non-Western mindset in which you go a little with the theme and then go back and touch base with it again, go a little farther. And that's kind of what we're seeing in chapter seven. 
So let me ask you this, because this is very similar language that you used in Psalm 1 when we studied back in the day. And I encourage our listeners to go back to Psalm 1. It was a wonderful study we had and, and an overview of the Psalms. But there's a different mindset when they wrote, you know, the, this literature. Moses had a different mindset. What is, do you, I mean, I'm putting you on, I'm putting you on, um, I'm, put, I'm putting you to the test here. But is there, do you have like a, a short suggestion of when we read the Old Testament, like Leviticus, it's different mindset mindset. So do you have an advice for people when they read this to um, be able to read it and and to not get too frustrated too quickly? Any thoughts? Well, so, yeah, I mean, this happens actually in Paul as well. So Western minds, True. let's just say outside of the genre of poetry, we are used to kind of straight line reasoning so that you have kind of a thesis or something put forward and then you have a developing argument. And so that, um, you know, in a coherent sermon, you, you should know what question you're trying to answer, what problem you're trying to solve. And then you discuss it and we can follow that very easily until you reach a conclusion, right? That's kind of mm -hmm. how we think, but um, not people that are not, schooled like that in, in non-Western cultures even today, the, the logic becomes much more circular and repetitive. And so if you're looking for a developing argument, um, it can get frustrating. And so sometimes they'll, it'll be that, you know, but usually that's over shorter parts of the text. I mean, when you get to the book of Deuteronomy, you see the same thing. These are sermons, but they don't uh, logically go. And it's the same thing when you read the prophets. Um, you know, if you, it's much easier if you think of the prophets as a group of sermons or collected sermons that may be loosely connected. All hmm. right, so you have to hang looser on that, but not try to make a developing argument. We had a great discussion of that. I don't know if the readers are interested in this, but in our Bible class on Sunday, we were looking at the end of Galatians. And um, so uh, what happens there um, is that Paul gives a bunch of maxims, all right, um, about bearing one another's burdens. And we kept, mm -hmm. people kept trying to figure out how those verses are related to each other, because they're not. And you're working really hard until I said, you know, they're kind of like each verse is more like a proverb than he's not trying to develop an argument. He's giving you different maxims. And so as soon as they saw that, everything kind of fell into place. It was kind of interesting. And so that's what happens in a book like Leviticus, and that's probably the best advice I can, I can give. Um, be ready to think more circular and repetitive. Um, mm -hmm. It's a very interesting. I can give you a little story here. I was teaching Deuteronomy to grads, and one of my students had just returned from Cote d'Ivoire as a missionary, been translating stuff. And we were talking about how Deuteronomy does this and how, you know, even a book like Leviticus does this. And we, we were puzzled by it until he raised his hand and said, it's funny you say that, because when I was translating material in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, I would say to the guy helping me translate, this makes no sense at all. It's repetitive. It doesn't seem to go anywhere. And the guy looked at him and said, what do you mean? It makes perfect sense to me. And so a light went on in our oh. class that, see, they're kind of thinking very differently about these things. And that, that story has always stayed with me and proved helpful. We shouldn't try to fit the different genre of the Scripture into kind of a Western synthesis, developing the argument kind of thing. That That'd is very helpful. Advice. That is very helpful, Dr. Seleska. I really appreciate that. And then the, one of the beauties that we have when we look at this is that we are able to admit that this is this is hard. This is hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it also is still God's word and the Holy Spirit works through it. So we can be patient because we know the end of the story and we know our end of the story. So just enjoy it, as uh, I say all the time in this program. Mm -hmm. And I know this happens everywhere because it's all gift. So let's enjoy the Good. gift as we dig in. Yep. So anything else before we begin, Pastor or Dr. Seleska? Uh, I don't think so. I think that's good. Yeah. We'll All right. Dive in if you want. Let's, let's dig in. Verses 1 through 10. Reminder to our listeners, we are reading from the English Standard Version of Leviticus chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. This is the law of the guilt offering. It is most holy. 
in the place where they kill the burnt offering, that they shall kill the guilt offering, and its blood shall be thrown against the sides of the altar. And all its fat shall be offered, the fat tail, the fat that covers the entrails, the two kidneys with the fat that is on them at the loins, and the long lobe of the liver that he shall remove with the kidneys. The priest shall burn them on the altar as a food offering to the Lord. It is a guilt offering. Every male among the priests may eat of it. It shall be eaten in a holy place. It is most holy. The guilt offering is just like the sin offering. There is one law for them. The priest who makes atonement with it shall have it. And the priest who offers any man's burnt offering shall have for himself the skin of the burnt offering that he has offered. And every grain offering baked in the oven and all that is prepared on a pan or a griddle shall belong to the priest who offers it. And every grain offering mixed with oil or dry shall be shared equally among all the sons of Aaron. So there's there's a lot of information there. How would you how would you break this down as we maybe get confused right away? Oh, okay, very good. So, <laughs> so you have all this detail, right? Um, what's frustrating about the book of Leviticus is that it doesn't tell you the theological significance of all these things. It's simply remember that, um, especially in the first part of, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of first one's first talking about them, it talks about, um, makes a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And also um, this is for your atonement. Uh, notice in like chapter one, verse four, it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Um, so you have all this ritual that you don't understand, okay, why are they doing that? And Moses never really tells us. So we're going to fr- be frustrated or we're going to be speculative or kind of arbitrary. If you try to start assigning significance to every little detail, I think what's important is that we shift our perspective on all of these sacrifices from thinking of them as sacrifices to thinking of them as sacraments. And that's a basic shift that we are not used to making when we're talking about the book of Leviticus, so that we think more in terms of law with these sacrifices than gospel. In other words, oh man, we have to do all these things, we have to get it right, and somehow on the basis of what is done, God forgives our sins, and it becomes kind of a law-oriented practice. And all ritual can do that, right? If we do our worship right, if we get this right, somehow that's more pleasing than if we don't. And we forget that the sacrifices are sacraments. In other words, um, they are visible signs connected with God's promise. Mm. So right away at the beginning of Leviticus, he, it's his word that says these are going to make atonement for you. Not because of any special manipulation of the meat and the way you cut it and how you offer it. You see, um, those are the things that provide the order and structure around which people can gather. Um, But finally, it's God's word that tells them, hey, (laughs) um, these forgive sins because I say they forgive. They're they're promise. All right. It's the same way with Holy Communion. I mean, it's bread and wine, but it's connected with God's word. And so it's that that makes it a sacrament. Um, Otherwise, it's just ordinary bread and wine, just like it's an ordinary lamb or an ordinary bull or whatever you're sacrificing. And so I think that it's helpful if we're studying the book of Leviticus for readers to also read the book of Hebrews. And specifically for this first part of Leviticus, Hebrews 8 through 10, which talks about uh, the relationship between Jesus and the sacrifice that he made and uh, the Old Testament sacrifices. Um, I think that that's kind of very helpful um, in that you see how the New Testament reads the significance of these sacrifices as foretastes or foreshadowings of uh, the one who made uh, the complete sacrifice and total sacrifice uh, for our sins. And again, that's because God declared, hey, this is my son. This is the one I'm pleased in. And he's the one who declares... um, 
that uh, your sins are forgiven. You are, he declares us just. He declares us righteous for Christ's sake in the word made flesh, so to speak. Right. Yeah. How can you not see Christ as you speak about all these sacrifices and offerings, which really points us to language that is, that's very helpful because I do get lost in the weeds. I, 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 well, I feel like I'm, I'm, <laughs> I fell in the weeds <laughs> as I've gone through right. Leviticus in many ways because you're trying to keep it straight. Okay, what's up with the guilt offering? Okay, this is uh, there's food for the priest. Okay, all right, the meat. Okay, that goes to this priest, and that goes here. And it's been wonderful to dig deep into that, but also chapter 7 is the perfect time for us to stop, think through what this is, and I love verse 1. Mm-hmm. It is the most is most holy, and mm-hmm. really our theme, um, trying to look at this, came from Dr. John Kleinig that really talked about this is really about God's holiness coming to God's people, um, mm-hmm. and so be holy as, as the Lord is holy, and that's what you, you you're you're pointing us to that once again, and I you know I didn't think about that today is that reality of these sacrifices were something to follow, but also it showed the holiness that comes to them in a sacramental way which is right. a great connection that we often would ever make. So any, any details yeah. or anything you want to highlight in those 10 verses? In those 10 verses, it's just that um, uh, notice that no one kind of knows exactly the connection between guilt offering and the um, whole burnt offering, uh, as it mentioned, you know, the, yeah. um, the laws, the instructions are the same. Uh, I mean, people have made guesses, but um, again, we don't have to kind of worry so much about that because when we ask what is what does Leviticus have to do with us Christians, uh, the way the way we strive for relevance or see relevance in them is in the light of Jesus and the one who has uh, declared us to be righteous and those kinds of connections are one of the ways we start to see here what's relevant to us and what's not, which is why we don't continue to offer bulls and lambs on an altar and make sure we're following all the priests because our authority now is not Moses, but Jesus, as Luther kind of makes clear. And also I think there's a great connection in verse 6 when you talked about the sacramental realm or a sacrament, the body and blood, is that they had to eat it in a holy place. And I, yeah. I think there's just a connection to that as well of of when we go to the holy place, which is where the holy things are in worship or the word of God, that that's where we that's where we eat and drink with with God's people. So it, there's it's wonderful bringing me back. You brought me back today because I got lost in the weeds. I'm like, oh, I wonder what he's going to say about this and, and the details. And he brings us back to the main point. So anything else in verse 10 verses? No, I, I think that that's important. Um that, uh, you know, there were these spheres of holiness, starting with the most holy place and then the holy place and then, you know, the um, courtyard and so forth until until if you, uh, as you'll see later in the book of Leviticus, if you had leprosy or some skin disease, you were actually exiled from camp, uh, considered unclean and only to be admitted back in. And so there is this sense of, I mean, the reality is God was actually present in the tabernacle, right mm-hmm. above the mercy. It wasn't just he, it wasn't just a sign of God's presence. He was really there, and so it was there that you went, and and you had this beautiful you have this beautiful picture of God has put His name there, and so in a sense reveals Himself there, and yet He's hidden, right? He's deeply hidden behind the curtain. You can't go back there without the atoning sacrifices and that kind of thing. And so there is this idea of being in God's presence, a uh, very real reality. I don't want to just say it's an idea or a concept. It's a reality when you went to the tabernacle or later the temple to worship. And how do you know that this God who is most holy is not going to strike you dead, you know, um, because of your sin and because of your wickedness? While well, the sacrifices assured them that um, – he was for them, that he had forgiven them, that he had reconciled them. And what happened in Israel, as happens for us as well, is they think that just by virtue of offering those sacrifices, God is somehow pleased with that, and they could live however they wanted. Remember, the prophets inveigh against that. I don't need your sacrifices. They weren't done. You remember the prophets say over and over, God doesn't need them. 
Um, and that's what makes Israel sacrifices very different from the ancient Near East, in which you had to feed the gods or you're trying to manipulate the will of God. Uh, the sacraments were for the people, not for God. And um, so we always get that in our thinking that God kind of needs our hymns and our prayers. And as long as we do due diligence, we can kind of live our lives the way we want, worship what we want and all those kinds of things. And Israel forgot that as well. And I'm I'm thinking about the influence, because you said it so well when we talk about the tabernacle, the temple, that the Holy of Holies, this is where actually God was. And sometimes I wonder if we tend to be, our filter is somehow through the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> like, like, well, yeah. we don't, re- what's behind that, what's behind that curtain is something that probably is not what we thought it was, or the holiness that is there, eh, it's probably not that big of a deal. That's kind of right. always, I, 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 I yeah, love a book. Good. If someone wants to read a write a book about that, that'd be great. Just you know, do we actually see God as as God, or do we see him as a guy yeah. behind the curtain in Wizard of Oz? But yeah, yeah. but as we look at image, as, yeah. so we look at that, it's a good reminder for us that God's presence is with us in the sacraments, yeah. as you as you said, when we mm-hmm. gather um, with God's people, and that He mm-hmm. is giving Himself to us, as opposed yeah. to us having to give ourselves to him because the, yep. the job is done. So yep. and Doc, I, I, one more ahead. point just to follow up. So Please. just think about it with Holy Communion in the New Testament. It's a foretaste of the feast to come. Mm. And so remember, in the feast to come, we will move from hearing about forgiveness to seeing, from hearing about the Lord to seeing face to face. And so it, too, now is if there is a veil between us who take Holy Communion and the heavenly realm where God dwells with his people. And one day that veil will be lifted, too, just like in the tabernacle. There is a veil separating the Lord who is sitting above the uh, mercy seat and the people who are gathered around the altar uh, with the sacrifices and in worship and praise and prayer. Dr. Soska, I want to touch more on that. We do have to get going beyond our break, but right now we need to take our break. We are praying and studying Leviticus chapter 7 with Dr. Timothy Soleska, and we will be right back. Mark, get set. Lace up your running shoes and hit the pavement Saturday, September 25th for the Houston Hustle 5K and Fun Run in St. Peter's, Missouri. Proceeds benefit the youth of Emmanuel Lutheran Church and School in St. Charles, Missouri, attending the LCMS National Youth Gathering. Find event and registration information at EmmanuelStCharles.org. The Houston Hustle 5K and Fun Run in St. Peter's, Missouri, Saturday, September 25th. Registration information at EmmanuelStCharles.org. Did you know that your individual retirement account may make the best gift to KFUO? The IRS now allows individuals 70 and a half or older to transfer their required minimum distribution directly to charity and avoid paying the associated income tax. These gifts can provide regular long-term resources to KFUO. If you have questions about making an IRA gift to KFUO, call me, Mary, at 314-996-1518. We'll send a representative out to help answer your questions and help you establish a legacy of giving to your favorite radio station, Worldwide KFUO. Life can be dramatic, but day-to-day relationships aren't always like you see on TV. You can help the young people in your life work through the drama by engaging them in conversations about healthy relationships. Use Connect With Me activity cards to start discussions on this subject and other topics that matter to teens. Visit health.mo.gov connect to access these free cards and resources. A message from the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services.
And welcome back. We are studying Leviticus chapter 7 with Dr. Timothy Seleska from Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri. And Dr. Seleska, we, we have to kind of plow through some verses here the rest of our time. But as we as we look, so far we've gone through the guilt offering, and we'll move forward to the peace offering. But I do want to ask this because uh, I want to make sure that we're on the same page. Is there anything else you want to highlight in the first 10 verses? Um, I think we can move on. I think that's about it. But if you have a question or something, I'm happy to try to answer it. (laughs) I do not. And we've not received a phone call yet. So let's keep moving forward then. We'll go 11 through 18 as we hear of the peace offerings. And this is the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings that one may offer to the Lord. If he offers it for a thanksgiving, then he shall offer with the thanksgiving sacrifice unleavened loaves mixed with oil unleavened wafers smeared with oil, and loaves of fine flour well mixed with oil. With the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving, he shall bring his offering with loaves or of leavened bread. And from it he shall offer one loaf from each offering as a gift to the Lord. It shall belong to the priest who throws the blood of the peace offerings. And the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving shall be eaten on the day of his offering. He shall not leave any of it until the morning. But if the sacrifice of his offering is a vow offering or a freewill offering, it shall be eaten on the day that he offers his sacrifice. And on the next day, what remains of it shall be eaten. But what remains of the flesh of the sacrifice on the third day shall be burned up with fire. If any of the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offering is eaten on the third day, he who offers it shall not be accepted, neither shall it be credited to him. It is tainted, and he who eats of it shall bear his iniquity. So we we yeah. see some law and we see some consequences. So what's happening here? Yeah. Well, first of all, this is my favorite sacrifice. Um, oh, right. The uh, <laughs> Zevach Shalamin is the Hebrew word. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, only I could say something like that, right? That's right. So, uh, yeah, so it's, you know, it's translated as uh, peace offerings, um, sometimes fellowship offerings. But mm-hmm. I said the Hebrew, Hashalamin, Shalom, the Hebrew word Shalom comes from that, which again has the sense of well-being or um, uh, when things are are whole, there's kind of a, you know, it's a very positive word. When things are whole and as they should be, uh, there's shalom, you know, and uh, this is the most, you, you can see that this one is the most, quote, sacramental of the sacrifices in that it's the only sacrifice that the congregation is allowed to partake of and eat in with and notice that uh hmm. you can do it i mean you also you offer it uh as thanksgiving so notice that there's a sort of freedom there you come in thanks to god for maybe the crops that he's given you or the child that he's given you or just because you're thankful for the life he's given you and uh, you can also come um, notice that it says in verse 16, uh, a vow, you know, so example is that uh, you've taken a vow for a certain period of time and now you come uh, and offer that offering or um, he's God has rescued you from trouble. And, you know, you've said, you know, if you rescue me, um, I promise to serve you and worship you and you come for that reason or then it just says free will offering freely you see so and and because the people eat it and they have to eat it in the presence of the lord in the temple or tabernacle you get a real picture of uh holy communion and in fact it's interesting jewish tradition i don't know if you're interested or not but Mm -hmm. i ran across this that um in the messianic age this will be the only sacrifice that remains which is kind of interesting because points us to that new testament picture of the eschaton the new age as this big feast and of course you have prophetic pictures of that as well and so just if you can just uh, put our, imagine these sacrifices were done with family and friends in a mood of all, notice they're always in the in mood of joy and celebration that these sacrifices would take place in. All right. And so, um, 
I, I, I love that aspect of kind of these offerings in particular um, when you think about their significance. Uh, again, I should not tell you, just to reinforce for people this sacramental thing, notice that um, when we celebrate Holy Communion, we call it God's action to us. That's the main mm-hmm. direction. But there are also we also call them Eucharist. Uh, it's, it's a Thanksgiving, right? And so we mm-hmm. also come, we do certain, we do certain things, sacrificial things, right? We come with repentant and thankful hearts. We gather at the table. Uh, we follow the particular order of the church. We uh, receive the elements, those kinds of things. But the sacramental aspect dominates. So, too, in these sacrifices, there are certain things that we do. So the priest prepares the sacrifices the certain way. There's a certain time you can eat them and not eat them. You come with thankful hearts, and then you receive God's blessing. See, so there yeah. are there are those parallels. It's very helpful for me to stop thinking of sacrifices as this dreary duty, uh, but a celebration. So in the big feast days, people come up to Jerusalem and they sacrifice all the time. See, and it's a great joy uh, for them to be able to do that. And one of the and that that's a great. I mean, at first you're like, "This is your favorite offering." I mean, come on now, what's going on? You know, how's this happening? But when you explain it that way, one, uh, we talked about this when we covered the peace offerings. Is the, there's a reality for each and every one of us on this side of eternity that we want peace and we want peace for the world. You can go that big, but just we want peace when our families get together. We want peace when we go home. We want peace with our yeah. children, with our spouse, with our yeah. Nate. We want peace. That's And that's why the so powerful, exactly what you just said, is that this is exactly what is, is brought in Thanksgiving, in the eating with the Lord that connects us to the Lord's Supper. And I was thinking about this too, that when we, when you, when we get together, we're not always the best at describing the joy of like, say, for example, Thanksgiving, we're like, oh, what do you like about Thanksgiving? Oh, I love the turkey. Well, part of it is you like that, but you you love the people you're around. I mean, it's just yeah, yeah, such right. joy. Yeah. It's such joy yeah. to be in that kind of presence. And then to think about that, that the Lord invited them to the table then, and he will invite us to the table and in the eschaton, as you said so beautifully. Yeah. Um, any other yeah, thoughts? See, that's why I, yeah, that's why I think they bring loaves of bread, too. They get to eat yeah. bread with the sacrifice. See, so it's this kind of fullness. Um, and uh, so it's a great picture of the fourth oh, feast of the feast. Yep. Now, I think there'll be one part of this, if I could ask you this. At the very end, all of a sudden, I mean, I'm feeling I'm feeling warm and fuzzies here that you've given me. No, no, and you. then in 17 and 18, it's kind of like, but if you, you know, if you eat this uh, on the wrong time, um, you are basically dead to me. You are unclean. So any, how would you address that with somebody? You're like, this is great. And all of a sudden, boom, boom, boom. You ate it the wrong time, wrong day, boom, you're unclean and you have iniquity on your hands. Any thoughts on, on the transition there in the last two verses? Yeah, it's so jarring to us. Uh, again, <laughs> I think that um, one of the things that when I see that, it just reminds me of, this joy, but it's not giddiness or frivolity. It's a joy that is kind of deep down, uh, being able to to sit in the presence of the Almighty God and be accepted by Him. Uh, mm. He doesn't. So so it's like better have your heart and mind ready to go with that as well. So there's kind of that, that aspect as well. I mean, it entails um, proper preparation, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. You don't want to come unclean or frivolous or anything like that. And a kind of a respect that's engendered by that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, that's not unlike what we do for Holy Communion. We ask people to prepare their hearts, um, and to not come to the table if you're unrepentant or don't know what's going on or anything like that. Um, and so that's kind of, again, how I we handle that um, so that it doesn't jar me so much. Right. And it, it um, it's, it's that realization that there is joy here, but it is not yeah. perfect. 
And yeah. I think that's, uh, yeah. you said that so well. Yeah. yeah. So let's keep moving you forward remember? since we're, go ahead, keep going. Yeah. What do you got? Yeah. All right. Well, just one more thing. Remember when Jesus had that parable about the feast and no one wanted to come and God, Jesus says, go out right. in the streets, invites everyone, he invites everyone. Someone comes in with dirty clothes. What are you doing here? It's like, where, where did that come from? <laughs> uh, it's the <laughs> same so kind true. of thing. <laughs> and I mean, much ink has been comes, spilled. Now he's, now he's, yeah. Yeah, he's not properly dressed or prepared like what the heck so there i know there you have that same mm. kind of paradox or tension absolutely so let's keep moving forward and if there's other thoughts you have as we move forward doctor uh, uh sure. we'll highlight that but it, we we see the uncleanliness and it continues on we'll go 19 yeah. through 27 flesh that touches any unclean thing shall not be eaten it shall be burned up with fire all who are clean may eat flesh but the person who eats the flesh of the sacrifice of the Lord's peace offerings, while an uncleanness is on him, that person shall be cut off from his people. And if anyone touches an unclean thing, whether the human uncleanness or the unclean beast or any unclean detestable creature, and then eats some of the flesh from the sacrifice of the Lord's peace offerings, that person shall be cut off from his people. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, You shall not eat fat of ox or sheep or goat, the fat of an animal that dies in itself, and the fat of the one who is torn by beasts may be put to any other use, but on no account shall you eat of it. And for every person who eats of the fat of an animal, which is a food offering, may be made to the Lord, shall be cut off from his people. Moreover, you shall not eat, eat no blood, whatever, whether of fowl or of animal in any of your dwelling places. Whoever eats any blood, that person shall be cut off from his people. Dr. Seleska, we have a little more of that. Like you said, it's kind of jarring, and the jarring kind of keeps yeah. going. And once again, you can get lost in the weeds. What's happening in these verses? Um, so let's. So you start for verse 22, right? I was following in yeah, Hebrew, so. I started in verse 19, and then went verse through 27. 19. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah, there we go. So again, um, they, you know, you'll see later in the book of Leviticus, of course, you'll cover those purity laws. And we have to remember that purity laws, one of the theological significance of them is it shows you the pervasiveness of sin as a condition. So we tend to think of sin as these bad acts that you do, right? It's more surface. You do something bad, that's a sin. We don't tend to think of sin as a power that has a sin in its grip or as a condition that we all have. And so the purity laws remind you that sin has uh, made all of us unclean, not just in our hearts or minds, but it, it extends to the physical realm as well. And so... Um, when the when you were unclean, you couldn't approach God because the sinful person cannot approach God. Um, the only way that the unclean can become clean is to be pronounced clean by the priest to do the the rituals and sacrifices so that you can approach God. Otherwise, you're going to be banished from the camp. And so, again, the seriousness of sin is not overlooked in those purity laws. Um, which is why, again, when Jesus came, notice what he did. In the Old Testament, if you touch something unclean, you become unclean. Jesus reversed that, and he touched unclean people. Uh, He went into unclean places, and he made the unclean clean. You know, he has the power over that. And that's why... Hebrews talks in such great at such great lengths about we don't have to do any of these things anymore to approach God uh, because of what our Lord has done for us and the uh, our being uh, sanctified and justified by God's grace in Jesus is thorough um, and so in the Old Testament we just have to remember um, that. What's happening here is foretaste of what's going to happen. But before Jesus came, year after year, time after time, day after day, sacrifices had to be offered. If you were unclean, you were in a state of separation from God. It was a visible reminder um, of what sin does. And But again, in Israel, there was this means 
for cleansing, for forgiveness. And it was through the mediation of the priest and the pronounced word and the um, sacrifices and those kinds of things. So that's what, again, I'm seeing here um, with uh, being unclean. Um, And that goes to the animal as well, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. You can't just, the Lord doesn't just want any blemished animal or anything like that. Um, and as, of course, as we know from uh, Leviticus earlier in the book, I think it's early, maybe it's later, 17, the life of the creature is in the blood. So right, um, right. you don't um, eat the blood. And that's it's an interesting dynamic because in Leviticus 3 is where we hear all the fat is the Lord's, don't drink the blood. And I mean, the the blood part, I, I kind of understand, but as I, this is one of those crazy connections again, that what does Jesus have us do? Drink his blood, you know? Yeah, um, so there the blood, yeah. we can we can make connections there. The fat one, I, I, I kind of struggle with that. Do you have anything on that? Or you, I don't know. Do you have anything well, on the fat, fat part? Well, I mean, mm-hmm. certain parts were prescribed for the priest. And again, um, and, and remember the priest's, the Levites were not given a share of land in Israel. Mm -hmm. So they dwelled in certain cities and they were supported by the sacrifices. So again, (laughs) we think of sacrifices as God needs these or giving them to God. No, God doesn't need those, but the priests do. And it's the same way with our offerings. We have this mindset, oh, we're giving money to God. Well, only in a removed sense, but really who needs our money is our neighbor. Our mm-hmm. pastors need our money. The, uh, uh, we, need, we use money to uh, support the ministry. The ministry hopefully is reaching out to not only members, but non-members. See, it's the neighbor that needs money. And so the same way in the Old Testament, um, you have the priest getting a certain portion and the people weren't to take that. All right. And remember the priests had, strictures too. In in Samuel, remember, um, Eli's sons were Mm -hmm. taking what wasn't theirs and doing it at the wrong time. They were violating sacrifice, and that became an abomination to the Lord as well. And that's, you know, it's helpful because sometimes we can sit there and say, oh, wow, I kind of like a little fat on my T-bone steak sure. or something, you know, yeah, and this no, is just God no. taking what I need. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah. so you forget that God did this and it was for the sake of the neighbor. I mean, for the, the yeah. Levites and for the sake of the neighbor, as you said, you said too, this is just connecting in my head now is, is that reality of a pagan God is like, okay, you gotta give this to God. Like this is to God. Mm-hmm. And da, 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 da. But here he's very right. clearly, they're pointing not only is this for a forgiveness piece, but for the sake of the neighbor as well. Yeah, he says it several times. It's for Aaron and his sons and those who offer. So um, that's kind of an important aspect of the sacrifice that, again, helps reorient our perspective about them. Well, let's keep moving forward. We have about eight minutes left in our time. So I'm going to read 28. I'm going to the end of chapter 7 to hear your thoughts. 28. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, Whoever offers a sacrifice of his peace offerings to the Lord shall bring his offering to the Lord from the sacrifice of his peace offerings. For his own hand shall bring the Lord's food offerings. He shall bring the fat with the breast, that the breast may be waved as a wave offering before the Lord. The priest shall burn the fat on the altar, but the breast shall be for Aaron and his sons. And the right thigh you shall give to the priest as a contribution from the sacrifice of your peace offerings. Whoever among the sons of Aaron offers the blood of the peace offerings and the fat shall have the right thigh for a portion. For the breast that is waved and the thigh that is contributed, I have taken from the people of Israel out of the sacrifices of their peace offerings and have given them to Aaron and the priest and to his sons as a perpetual due from the people of Israel. This is a portion of Aaron and of his sons from the Lord's food offerings from the day they were presented to serve as priests of the Lord. The Lord commanded this to be given them by the people of Israel. From the day that he anointed them, it is a perpetual is a perpetual due throughout their generations. This is the law of the burnt offering, of the grain offering, the sin offering, 
guilt offering and the ordination offering and of the peace offering, which the Lord commanded Moses on Mount Sinai on the day he commanded the people of Israel to bring their offerings to the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai. So we, what I do want us to address this. I want to start with a wave offering. I mean, that one just kind of, what, what's going on? Now we're waving things? So, so, so there's, <laughs> there's a lot of things. So what's happening here? Okay, so first of all, um, let me look at that. I need to get that verse again, 30. So there's the two words there. Um, let me see here. I think it's terumah. I just want to be sure. Oh, uh, yeah, it's a tenufa. So you have a, this wave offering and the uh, terumah. So both in, in ESV terumah, when you saw the word contribution, it's the contribution. And nuf mm-hmm. uh, is sometimes translated as wave offering, but... Again, what those words mean and what actions they entail, you're not quite sure of. So some people think it, it means that you're not actually waving it, but holding it out or something like that. Um, and so, again, the correct or the best gloss for that is somewhat uncertain for us. And when you know people use, okay, what's the etymology of the verb, and there's more than one possibility for both of those words, actually, um, when you look at them. So teruma and terufa. So sometimes they say, well, they seem to be similar actions or similar uh, ideas, but what they are, no one's quite sure. So we have to be careful, I think, about making too much or giving too hard an interpretation on that. <laughs> Cause we well, it's just interesting. Know. That he has a breast and then he's waving it around and you're like, what's yeah. happening? And obviously yeah. we can cut in those weeds. And we, and that, like I said, it, we just simply don't know, but we do know it's an offering to the Lord. So anything else in these verses? Um, again, you can see the emphasis toward the end of the chapter on Aaron and the sons and providing for them. And yeah. mm-hmm. so um, the, so we have to, you have to think of the sacrifices both on a vertical level and horizontal level as well. Um, and, um, you know, when we think of congregation who gathers around God's promises, if we think solely vertically, then we're not taking care of our neighbors. And if we think solely of our neighbors, then we forget the reason we're gathered together and serve each other and do all the things we do as God's people in the first place. So there's that kind of balance that I think we can at least use this passage to reflect on in our own lives. So at the very end, he he gives a, a just a, a a summary a summary statement of yeah. all the offerings and where this happens. I think this is important. It brought me back definitely of okay, this is what we've been covering a lot in the seven chapters. Any thoughts on how Moses makes that transition as we get to chapter eight of kind of giving a summary statement those last few verses? Or what do you have anything on that? No, I think I think you're right. This this is a summary. So as a reader of this, notice that. Um, We've gone through some of this stuff twice now, and like I said at the beginning of our hour, and now you get this real sense, okay, he's going to move on to something else, and indeed he does. So it serves as a good uh, ending to the first part of the book, and now what you see in chapters 8 through 10 are is instructions for putting the tabernacle service into action, so to speak, right? So that yeah. you have the consecration of Aaron and uh, Aaron's offering, and then you have well, the death. That's a bad, bad note. The death of Nadab and Abihu um, yeah. when stuff doesn't go right. Okay, and so you have that. Okay, we're putting this stuff into action now, and then you get uh, in chapter 11 through 15 all these purity and impurity laws before you get to the holiness code um, after the day of atonement. So you're kind of moving on to here's all the prescriptions or instructions for what goes on in the tabernacle to, okay, let's start to put this stuff into operation with Aaron and his sons and so on. Now, Dr. Seleska, we have about two, two, two almost three minutes uh, left. Now, I had a pastor come to me. I was just at Pastors Conference, which was a wonderful time at Lutheran Island Camp here in Minnesota North. And one pastor came out to me, a dear friend, and he said, man, I am loving studying Leviticus. He was all excited. And, and, and I, I thought it was great. Um, and sometimes people can say, well, that's all pastors talk. You know, what's going on? 
looking at Leviticus 7, and maybe the first seven chapters since it's a summary, why is this important for us or for, for a layperson, for, for other church workers, whoever, for the Christian? Why is Leviticus important for us, and how would you break that down for somebody if they asked? Okay, so I would say that for the first seven chapters of Leviticus specifically, it helps us see how God works with his people in both distinct ways, but also in the same way. So you see very distinct things with tabernacle, with sacrifices, with all of this. And yet, when you start to see what is the theological significance of all of these things, uh, the biggest part of it is that relationship with the Lord and his people is at stake. How do they know God loves them? How do they know that he's going to keep his word? Well, he dwells in their midst, and they uh, he assures them of their forgiveness through these continual sacrifices. And that sustains them as they look forward to life in the promised land and look forward to the final fulfillment of all that God had promised Abraham and Isaac and, and Abraham's descendants and Israel. Um, and so Leviticus is this rest point, right? The Israel is not on the move until halfway through the book of Numbers and um, getting how do we live as God's people, as sinful people. So remember, when Jesus comes, what does he call himself? He, he says, destroy this temple in three days, I will ra- raise it. Or the word became flesh and made his tent among us. So he tells us, oh, he's, we move from place to person in the New Testament. And he's the high priest. He's the sacrifice, as the book of Hebrews reminds mm-hmm. us. And so, again, you see this move from our perspective of Israel condensed into one. So we have been grafted into Israel's story. And in that sense, then, um, it's uh, our Lord Jesus who has uh, brought us in to uh, be people of the promise. And as we then worship him we gather around his word and sacraments and the promises as we wait for him to do what he promised to do and so in that sense modern people are in kind of the same position as israel how do we live as god's people how do we know god loves us how do we know he's going to keep his promises how do we know he hasn't forsaken us we have his promises in the gospel we have them as he gives them in Holy Communion and baptism and in absolution and in our uh, conversations with each other. And so did the Old Testament people. Do- Reverend Dr. Timothy Seleska, professor of exegetical theology at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, giving us God's strong word from Le- Leviticus chapter 7. Dr. Seleska, thank you for giving us the gifts. You're very welcome. It's always a pleasure, Bray. Saints of our Lord, it is God who is not behind a curtain like the Wizard of Oz. He is a loving God who wants to make sure our relationship is secure and we know it is through Christ. How do we know God loves us? Because it is Christ who is the final offering. So we move forward in Leviticus knowing the end of the story and that our Lord dwells with us. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for joining us and the Lord keep you safe in the palm of his hands.